I've been going to college here in Washington State for two full semesters before I finally decided to join a fraternity. I'm not a party animal or anything, but the stories I'd heard about a particular fraternity's parties were enough to convince me that I had to do whatever it took to join. Initiation week was exactly what you'd expect. They made us stay up for several nights in a row, eat some raw sardines, stuff like that. The crowning moment of initiation was that each initiate had to spend a night in the so-called murder forest, just outside the city. This forest is famous in our area for being haunted. Apparently, several serial killer victims were found there, and on top of that, people hear weird sounds sometimes. Still, lots of places have local legends, and I figured that the stories had been exaggerated to enhance our hazing experience. So the six other initiates and I hopped into vans and we were driven to the edge of the forest. One of the older members told us that we should walk for about an hour along a path and that we'd find a campsite where we could spend the night. Each of us was carrying a backpack with a sleeping bag and tarp to lay on. I had been walking with the other guys in the group for 45 minutes, an idea crossed my mind. The rules we'd been given said we had to spend the night in the forest, not that we had to spend it in a particular area. They wanted us at that campsite so they could come in during the night and mess with us, I had no doubt. So I decided to set off into the woods by myself to avoid the hassle that sleeping in the designated campsite would bring. I congratulated myself on my smarts, thinking I had avoided any trouble. I was wrong. I walked for another 15 minutes or so by myself, lighting my way with a flashlight. I found a nice secluded spot with a clearing. I looked around and saw it was completely empty, so I set up my tarp and laid out my sleeping bag. The forest was alive with the sounds of crickets, birds, and wind. I lay down in my sleeping bag, feeling satisfied and flipped off the light. The forest fell silent. I don't mean to say that the wind lulled, or that there was a momentary lapse in crickets. I mean that everything that could make a sound stopped making noise all at once. It was so sudden and so complete that I thought I had gone deaf. I pulled my hand up to my ears, but when I rubbed my fingers together, the soft rustling sounded out like normal. I looked around in the pitch darkness, but a thick layer of clouds made the night nearly absolutely dark. I was fumbling for my flashlight when I felt it. A warm, humid breath spread across the back of my neck, like a person was standing six inches behind me blowing slowly. It stood in stark contrast to the chilly early spring air I had been feeling up till then. My hand found the flashlight and I spun it around, illuminating the clearing behind me, revealing nothing but grass and trees. The instant my light turned on, the sound returned to the forest, crickets and cicadas chirping away softly. I started to stand up to leave, but stopped myself. I had to have been psyching myself out. All the stories from the frat must have just been getting to my head. I couldn't explain the silence, but I resolved to stay the night. I laid back down with the light and finally turned it back off. I half expected the forest sound to go with it, but thankfully the crickets and wind stayed constant. I laid in the darkness for a while, trying to relax my heart rate enough to fall asleep. After what must have been half an hour, I finally drifted off. I don't know how much time passed, but I was woken up by a new sound. It was the sound of rhythmic heavy breathing occasionally broken up by mumbling. The sound was coming from in front of my sleeping bag and high above me probably some 30 feet away. I pulled out my phone and opened the camera app. I took a picture with the flash to light up the clearing and saw a figure in the tree staring down at me. It was a woman wearing a long white dress. She had long black hair that covered her face, and her face, it looked like the skin had worn through in places. She was staring down at me. The image from the flash was burned into my mind. I kicked out of my sleeping bag and started running away through the forest in my bare feet. I couldn't hear a motion behind me, but I didn't stop running until I reached the edge of the forest where I got cell service. I grilled the members of the fraternity after I got back, but they each swore that they had nothing to do with it. I had been right about them scaring the other members of the group, but they had just used air horns and guns with blanks to scare them while they slept. I guess it's possible that they were behind it all, but I can't see how they could have made the forest silent or breathed on the back of my neck when not even the other initiates knew where I was, and that woman was not something fraternity members could have created. If I find anything else out, I'll let you know. 
no one believed what happened to my father, even after that famous YouTuber went missing for a week in the same stretch of woods, but Dad was the first to be taken. My father and I decided to go camping to help celebrate his promotion at work. He was a seasoned camper, but I was relatively new to it all. We spent most of the day riding our dirt bikes through a few of the trails toward the bottom of the mountain, but when the sun started to set, we decided to make camp for the night. We set up our tents, and I gathered some firewood with Dad. We got a pretty decent-sized fire burning before eating dinner and toasting some marshmallows. When the sun was completely gone, I was genially afraid of how many stars there were. Being from the city meant I was only used to seeing a few stars in the night sky, but out there, away from civilization, it was as if I could see the entire galaxy and it was unsettling. Further putting me on edge, the sounds of the various nocturnal insects buzzing and chirping was a lot louder than back home. There weren't any howling wolves, but there was the occasional owl hoot. The trees even groaned a little, swaying in the gentle breeze that blew between them. Dad decided it would be fun to tell a ghost story, and for one of the stories, he had to act out one of the scenes. He stood beside a tree, but as he acted out the scene, I noticed something was carved into the bark. What do you think that is, I asked, standing and pointing to the symbols. He frowned a little, disappointed I wasn't very interested in his ghost story. He turned his attention to where I was pointing and continued to frown. I'm not sure. I kind of noticed it before, but I guess my brain automatically assumed it was just one of those Jack Loves Jane messages kids like to carve into the trees. He leaned down a little and stood in a way that allowed the light from the fire to flicker off the tree. I followed suit. The symbols had been organized into a diamond pattern, carved a few inches deep into the bark. Hmm, and it looks like a tool was used to carve this, Dad said, running his fingers along the inside of one of the larger symbols. It's extremely, ugh. Dad jerked his hand back and sucked on the tip of his finger. He chuckled a little. Well, I was going to say smooth, but it cut me, so I guess I'm a little wrong. As Dad spoke his sentence, the insects stopped buzzing and chirping, the owls stopped hooting, and the gentle breeze that blew through the trees turned into a strong gust. The wind blew some dust into both of our eyes, and we tried to clear them with the back of our hands. We went back to the fire and sat down, but Dad didn't stop rubbing his eyes. We didn't speak for a few minutes, but when Dad stopped rubbing and looked at me, I gasped and almost scooted back. I, I can't see, he said, blinking a few more times. Your eyes, I started, pointing at him. I had expected his eyes to be a little red from irritation, but instead, both of his eyes were black now. At first, I thought they were gone, but as I moved them around trying to look at things, I could tell they were still there, just completely devoid of color. Dad, I think we need to go to the hospital or something. Your eyes are completely black, like they're covered in soot. That would make sense, I guess. Maybe that gust of wind blew some into my eyes. I can't see a thing. Okay, here, I'll help you, I started, standing up and moving toward him. I grabbed his arms and helped him to his feet. My mind raced with possibilities when it came to getting help. Since we rode separate dirt bikes to the campground, there was no way he'd be able to ride without vision. It was possible we could walk the bikes out and I could guide him, but that would take forever. Dad, maybe we can walk the bikes out. I can help you so you don't run into anything? Does that? But before I could finish, I glanced at the tree with the symbols and was petrified. There, on the bark, about a foot above the symbols, was a set of eyes glaring at us. There were no eyelids, just two eyeballs wedged into the bark as if someone had carved out two holes and pushed them in. What? What is it? Dad said, bending down to rub his leg. Why did you stop? but it took me a minute or so to formulate a response. I took a few steps back and pulled him with me, and the gaze of the eyes followed us. There are eyes on the tree, I whispered, as if the eyes would hear me and get angry. What, like potato eyes? Like the little white things that sprout on potatoes? Before I could answer, Dad winced and dropped to the ground. He started rubbing his leg even more, and I lifted up his pant leg. Sure enough, like his eyes, his leg was pitch black including the hair that would normally have been brown. 
I looked at the tree again, and to my horror, I saw that it now had a leg toward the base of the trunk. I looked at the eyes again, and though it was hard to confirm due to the low lighting and distance, I swore they were my father's eyes. But instead of being filled with love and compassion like my father's usually were, these eyes were devoid of emotion, just staring at me like a spooky wooden doll. Dad started rubbing his other leg, and I stood up, stepping back. I felt guilty about it later, but my thoughts shifted toward personal preservation as I questioned whether whatever was happening to him was contagious. He started rubbing his torso and his arms, and a few seconds later, the tree took on those body parts as well. No, 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 I started saying as Dad started rubbing at his face and scalp. Then he stopped moving, becoming a completely black, motionless figure beside the campfire. My heart was racing a mile a minute as I looked at the tree. Embedded in the trunk was the image of my father, complete with his face which was now twisted into a morbid grin. I shook what used to be my father a few times just in case, never taking my eyes off the tree. When he gave no response, I grabbed the keys to both bikes and hopped on mine. I didn't care about our camping supplies or bother putting out the fire. Instead, I turned the key in the ignition, sighing in relief when it started. Movement on the tree caught my eye, and I watched in terror as the embedded body strained against the bark. It pulled most of itself out and was only connected at its back by a few twigs and bits of bark for a while before finally breaking free. It never blinked, glaring at me and smirking. When it took a step forward, I twisted back the throttle and sped off, daring a glance every second or so, but happy I'd taken both keys so at least it couldn't pursue me on the bike. I almost biffed it a few times, but managed to make it back to the main road, and then back to my house a couple of hours later. It was the middle of the night, but I banged on the door until Mom opened up. She brought me inside and calmed me down enough for me to try and formulate what I had just witnessed. I tried explaining exactly what happened, but it was too far-fetched for her to believe. She kept shaking her head and saying I was in shock, asking why I had left my father at the campsite. A firm knock at the front door pulled both of our attentions, and Mom opened it. There, at the threshold, was the beast from the forest that had assumed my father's identity. It didn't say a word, but Mom fell on it, embracing it as if she hadn't seen her husband in years. It locked eyes with me and my heart nearly beat its way out of my chest. I tried to convince mom that dad was dead, and the thing that had come home that night was a monster with unknown intentions, but she refused to listen. I even managed to take the cops up to the campsite the next morning, but dad's body was gone. The symbols were still carved into the tree, but now there was an additional symbol above the others. Since the cops found nothing and mom refused to believe me, I had no choice but to move out. A few others have gone missing, and I know they were taken by the same creature, and one day I'll figure out a way to fight them. Until then, the best thing I can do is spread awareness.